congratulations to the newest students of Columbia University. I am Lisa Rosen Metch, and I have the honor and privilege to be the Dean of the Columbia School of General Studies, or GS as we know it. I am thrilled today to welcome 532 undergraduates, 236 dual degree undergraduate students, and 132 students in our post-baccalaureate pre-medical pre-health program. I also want to give a warm welcome to all the family members, friends, and supporters who have joined us virtually today. Take a moment to thank all those who've supported you to get to this point today. We are very honored to have with us this morning the president of Columbia University, Lee C. Bollinger, and the executive vice president and dean of the faculty of the arts and sciences, Amy Hungerford. This is a very special day for all of us here at Columbia as we are able to gather together once again in person on this magnificent campus here in Morningside Heights. On that note, I want to take a moment to welcome once again our students that began their undergraduate studies in the fall 2020 and the spring of 2021. Give yourselves a round of applause. Please know that the students, leaders, faculty, staff, and I have spent all summer preparing for you to experience all that Columbia has to offer with special attention to your health and safety, and we are overjoyed to see you in person. At Columbia GS, we know that many of you have had diverse, nonlinear paths to Columbia University. And for many of you, your stories have had moments of uncertainty and the unexpected. Today, though, is a testament to your resilience and a commitment you are making to yourselves and your futures. Now more than ever, your pursuits at Columbia and the convictions and dedication you bring to your studies are needed in our communities. We are facing serious, complex challenges, and you all will be part of the future's solutions. For now, let me say how happy I am that you are here with us, and how proud I am to introduce you to all that Columbia University and GS is and offers. I now have the honor of introducing to you the 19th president of Columbia University, Lee C. Bollinger. Under President Bollinger's leadership, Columbia stands at the very top rank of research universities distinguished by academic excellence, historic institutional development, an innovative and sustainable approach to global engagement, and excuse me, unprecedented levels of alumni involvement. President Bollinger is also a committed educator, continuing to teach an undergraduate course on the First Amendment, even while he leads this great university. Since I began my tenure as dean three and a half years ago, I have seen firsthand his commitment to the mission of the Columbia School of General Studies and to you, our extraordinary students. It is my privilege to welcome President Lee C. Bollinger.
Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, and uh, welcome to all of you. I want to just begin by saying how important general studies is to Columbia. It is an extraordinary institution. There's no place else like it in the world. And we are thrilled to have you with us. Talent comes at many points in life, and you are among the most talented here with us now. So it is with great pleasure and honor that I, on behalf of the entire university, welcome you to begin your undergraduate studies at Columbia. This ceremony, officially known as Convocation, always marks the beginning of the academic year. But your presence today gives it a very special meaning. The collective dreams represented in this audience, together with the sheer determination and endurance you have demonstrated in order to be here and to give those dreams a chance of becoming reality, makes us all the more impressed and inspired. Along with your parents and families and friends who join us this evening in person or, in, or today in person or in spirit, we also welcome those. We are confident that what brought you to this point in life will sustain you in the years ahead and after you leave Columbia. I also want to add that each of us at Columbia is also feeling that this remarkable occasion will hopefully end, mark the end of a hell endured and offer a fresh start on life. For this is among the first ceremonies this week to be held in person in more than a year and a half. Therefore, for all of us, this is not only a convocation to mark your entrance into college, but a convocation for life itself. Thus, we celebrate together two happy and converging beginnings in our lives. I would like to touch briefly this morning on three matters, all interconnected, but each worthy of separate attention, and I hope useful for us to think about on this special occasion. The first is the intellectual character we strive for in a university, and most certainly at Columbia. The second is to understand and to appreciate what universities are and do for the society and the world, and how Columbia fits into that constellation of institutions. And the third is about you and a few recommendations I want to offer as you embark on this incredible adventure. So let me begin by focusing on the norms of intellectual character that we expect of ourselves at Columbia. You are entering a unique intellectual environment, and it is important that we be clear about it from the outset. There are two distinct parts to a university, each with its own rules about how to think. One part is called the public forum, it might be called the public forum, in which students and faculty express their views about the issues of the day. We debate, we offer our opinions, we raise questions, we consider ideas and work through our thoughts on matters we regard as important. Most of the time, this is an internal community conversation, but often speakers from outside are invited in to join in these discussions. The rules here are more or less those that apply in the nation as a whole. Because we are a private, not a state-sponsored institution, the First Amendment does not apply to Columbia. But Columbia, like every other university essentially in America, has chosen voluntarily to abide by the principles and doctrines of the First Amendment when it comes to our own public forum. That means many things, too many for me to even begin to talk about them here, but it most certainly means this. We do not and will not punish or officially sanction anyone for their speech because many, or even most of us, regard the ideas expressed 
to be offensive or dangerous or harmful. There are, to be sure, some limits, incitement to imminent violence, personal harassment. There are, to be sure, uh, limits uh, we will abide by, but for the most part, the bulk of speech, including really bad and ugly ideas, is by long experience and tradition fully protected by the First Amendment and accordingly fully protected here. So be forewarned, you are about to live in a community where offensive and harmful expression is part of what we, we must learn to endure and to counter through means other than censorship and counter we must through our own speech. So, being prepared for being offended and living with difficult and even harmful speech is part of what it means to be at a university. I say this fully conscious of the fact that all this may seem right to nearly everyone in the abstract, but not at all so when the injury of truly bad speech is right before us. The fact is the practice of free speech is hard. It is counterintuitive and it requires real effort to live according to its expectations. Human nature makes us more inclined to be intolerant than tolerant. We like to have beliefs. We like to define ourselves, to create our identities through our beliefs. And when our beliefs or ourselves are attacked, especially unfairly, our first inclination is to crush the opposition. We have over time, however, come to realize that we need to learn how to moderate those impulses in order to live successfully in what is bound to be, certainly in a democracy will be, a near constant state of disagreement and even disagreeability. There is nothing preordained about this way of structuring a society. Indeed, it is highly unusual in human affairs to take this path. It is therefore one of the great experience experiments in social organization. So you should think about our own public forum as an entry point into this larger human debate. And that brings me to the other part, indeed the major part of what we do in a university, namely to be serious, very serious about the search for truth understanding and knowledge through our scholarship and teaching. We all know it would not be a very good or even desirable life if we always lived by the rules of the public forum. And so we don't. Fortunately, we have institutions like universities where we put our faith in the rigorous professional norms of academic inquiry, what I call the scholarly temperament. In the academic world, we are devoted to reason, committed to inquiry for the sake of knowing, dedicated to preserving and carrying forward the best of the human mind, best forever being redefined. We are insistent on a disposition of open-mindedness, self-doubt, and respect for the judgment of peers. In contrast to the public forum where we abjure reasonable ways, uh, restrictions on speech. In the academy, we go beyond, well beyond, what we might call normal ways of thinking and insist on strict notions of good thought. Stupidity, ignorance, falsehoods, lies, incivility, plagiarism, all these and other sins of the mind are actively forbidden and penalized, censored, if you will. We do this not because we ourselves like to be this way, although we do, but because we have been charged by our public charter to find knowledge, and this is the best way we know how to do that. It's a serious business we're engaged in, and just as the intellectual character needed for the public forum is difficult to come by, so too does the scholarly temperament not come naturally 
and for similar reasons. To do it requires patience, self-restraint, and continuous practice. We must always be on guard against our natural inclinations. So universities are complex and life is complex. The rules that work for public discussion are not those that work for building knowledge. We need both realms and each is better for the other. This brings me to the second large subject, which is the value of universities. We often hear people speak about the importance of truth and its pursuit. What I want you to know is that universities collectively are the societal home for the search for truth. More new knowledge has been generated by these institutions, especially over the last century, than anywhere else in society. Just about everything that you and we take for granted as constituting a modern life can be traced to discoveries in our laboratories, our libraries, and research studies. Just think about the pandemic and the ensuing world crisis. It has been the expertise of public health, medicine, and the biological sciences especially that have taken us from being helpless victims at the mercy of the virus to agents able to fight for our own destiny. So never take for granted while you are here that what the academic community and world does for humanity. To be sure, Columbia University leads among these academic institutions, and we bear special responsibilities. To that end, we are innovative, dynamic, and always open for creativity and new ideas. Everywhere you go, there are professors who lead their disciplines. No university is more committed to teaching, and you are the beneficiaries of that ethos. Columbia is the most international and global university with more international students, nine global centers, and countless programs and opportunities to experience the world. Columbia is among the most scholarly and the best academic traditions and the most determined to try to have knowledge serve the public good. We call this belief that knowledge should have consequences for the public good and that it is part of our role to help see that happen, we call this the fourth purpose of a university, represented in a new organization called Columbia World Projects. And Columbia has initiatives at every intersection of new knowledge, in neuroscience, precision medicine, cancer, data science, democracy in crisis, racial justice, and the arts. And now we have the first school of climate in the world, and this week we welcome our first students. This brings me then to you. I want to return to what I said at the beginning. It is impossible for anyone to grasp just how difficult and complex the last few years have been on your lives. You have been through an enormous amount, perhaps more than any generation since the Second World War when General Studies was created. It is not just, hopefully, the once-in-a-century pandemic, but the fragility of democracy in America, the continuing injustices of race, the emergent consequences of climate change, and most recently, the tragedies surrounding America's exit from Afghanistan. But most certainly, the pandemic. There is a lot to say about all of these converging historic events, but I would now just emphasize one. As you enter <clears throat> this special period of your long lives, a unique period by any measure, and work to master the complex intellectual mentality and character of academic life in an institution that is but one of a large group of vastly successful and important universities with special responsibilities of leadership. I ask that you give yourselves the time, the freedom, and the opportunities to explore what all this can mean to you. The extraordinary burdens you have borne 
and the life experiences you bring with you now will provide you with an unusual intellectual maturity with which to encounter and come to terms with the greatest issues of humankind, which is so much of our focus here. Things that seem abstract to many people will be very real and vivid to you, and this will be to your educational advantage. There will be plenty of time in life to become an expert in something, plenty of time in which to specialize and get ahead, but I can assure you there will in all likelihood only be this precious time in which to experience the comprehensive quest for knowledge that defines the distinctive academic world both in substance and in intellectual character. It may sometimes seem as if an attitude of exploration is self-indulgent or wasting time or not purposeful enough, but you will in fact be able to draw on these experiences for the rest of your lives. Approached with a spirit of exploration, your time here will ultimately be life expanding. Above all, I want you to know and to feel that everything you will do here is part of something larger, something I believe that is often noble, it is complex, it is worth trying, it is mature and at scale large and consequential. That is my deepest hope for your experience, that you will connect to what happens here to this larger reality. So on behalf of the university, welcome to Columbia, welcome to the life of the mind, and welcome back to life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, President Bollinger. We are so fortunate to have you as our president. Now I have the great pleasure to introduce to you Professor and Dean Amy Hungerford, the Executive Vice President and Dean of the Faculty of the Arts and Sciences. In her roles here, Professor Hungerford oversees the Arts and Sciences faculty and is responsible for its five schools. Columbia College, the School of General Studies, the School of Professional Studies, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and the School of Arts. As a professor of English and American Studies and a respected scholar, Professor Hungerford's expertise lies in the literature of post-1945 America. She has written extensively about the influence of social networks on contemporary writers and their audiences, as well as the role of religion in modern American literature. In addition to her notable scholarship and highly regarded teaching and mentorship, Professor Hungerford is deeply committed to bettering the institutional community. She has been a wonderful partner since she started here at Columbia right before the pandemic and worked with me and our team here at GS to enhance support of our GS students during this very challenging period. Please join me in welcoming Professor and Dean and EVP Amy Hungerford. Thank you, Dean Rosenmetsch. Good morning, new Columbians. It is good to see you. On behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, it is a joy to welcome you to this great university. We greet you with a special intensity of feeling today because you arrive to a campus whose life has been interrupted these past 18 months. Like me, you may be immersed in a happy crowd for the first time since March of 2020. What it has taken to arrive at this moment, both for the university and for society, has proven the necessity of human collaboration, to push research towards the medicines we need, to plan the complex logistics of safety, to study those, what those should be day by day, to call a community to act in concert for the good of individuals, to address the inequities that inhibit collective actions. 
This interruption has taught us much. And here you come bringing this campus, your campus, to life again. Many of you specialists in the experience of interruption. General studies as a school famously opens a door for students whose undergraduate education or its timing during early adulthood has been interrupted. GS creates space for students to pursue pre-medical education after they have left college. And it builds programs that allow students to earn their degrees at two universities, often on different continents, transitioning from one to the other midstream. Interruption has been generative for many of you, arising from your own talents, your own sense of life's timing and purpose, your own choice. Alongside the dual degree and pre-medical students, this assembly includes dancers, models, activists, military veterans, artists, and entrepreneurs. Some might feel keenly that what has been interrupted in their lives this morning is not schooling, but a calling embraced. For some of you, interruption has come unbidden from external forces, sickness, the needs of family, an ill-fated choice, adversity, hardship, accident. For you, the story of your arrival here is different. Your wisdom about interruption is all about the recovery from it the dedication to a long-held goal, the willingness to take a risk in returning to the classroom. And for others, whatever pulled you away from your formal studies remains firmly part of your life, exerting the same pull it always has. What's new, perhaps, is the decision to return to school on your own terms, because the rest of life is not stopping graciously for a full-time, multi-year run. I project these scenarios from a place of difference. Since the day I toddled into kindergarten, only a single year of my life has unfolded without the secure return to the classroom. And during that year of full-time work, well, I do admit it, I still worked for a school. Surely, this has been a great privilege. For me, the classroom and its inseparable companion, research, has been a space of freedom and endless renewal. My sense of mission is embodied in my students and all the uses they find of the things we learn and create together. As a dean, that mission is multiplied by the five schools, hundreds of faculty members, and thousands of students. It is my job to support and steward on behalf of this university. Even so, interruption is a constant companion and not just in pandemic times. My teaching changed profoundly and for the better one day 20 years ago when I was both a young teacher and a young mother. That day, bleary from a nocturnal baby, I walked into my lecture with no script, just a slim vol volume of Allen Ginsberg's poetry and an argument, and 180 students, and emerged a different kind of teacher. Risking the control of that classroom hour, the lecture hall became for me a place where discovery happens in real time, and as it turns out, that's far more interesting for students. Is life the interruption of schooling? Is schooling the interruption of life? Truly, these must be the wrong forms of the question. Interruption is our schoolhouse so long, and here is the important part, as we are students. And by students, I mean persons who are learning consciously, systematically, seeking change, seeking truth, creating knowledge, testing it, making claims, revising them, revising them again, and doing all this moreover in the company of others who are themselves at this very same business. Your presence on this campus makes Columbia unique among un elite universities. No other Ivy League institution has the privilege of routining, routinely including the kind of extraordinary students you are into the ordinary classroom. Your experiences interrupt the too certain answer, 
the provincial purview, the swagger of innocence. Yes, innocence can swagger. Your questions are likely to be the hard ones. Why does this matter? How do we know? Is this true everywhere? What shall we do? I promise that interruption will remain a part of your own experience too, even as you enter the steady rhythm of class meetings and problem sets, papers and readings. I urge you to continue to embrace and engage it. This world of Columbia is not predictable, and the day it becomes so, we should all find another place to go. Welcome to Columbia. We are thrilled and grateful to have you here. Thank you, uh, Professor Hungerford Amy, for joining us. Now in its 74th year, Columbia GS is distinguished by our twofold mission. First, we seek to recruit, advise, educate, and support students with untraditional backgrounds and to integrate them fully into the Columbia undergraduate program. Put simply, we provide the finest liberal arts education to exceptional students with non-traditional backgrounds or students who follow a non-traditional path. And second, we seek to create new and innovative models for undergraduate education, such as our dual and joint BA programs and the post-baccalaureate pre-medical pre-health program. You should take seriously the fact that the Columbia undergraduate classroom is unlike that of any other Ivy League university because of you and what you bring to the intellectual discourse on campus. We prove time and time again that the classroom is far more engaging when GS students with your diversity of life and academic experiences are brought together in the classroom with students from more traditional backgrounds and experiences to benefit and engage one another intellectually and socially in creative ways. None of this would be possible, however, without the exceptional commitment of the world-class Columbia faculty of the arts and sciences to the mission of GS and to GS students. Faculty members are your biggest advocates, so engage them whenever possible. The second part of the GS mission is to recruit intellectually creative and adventurous students for our cutting edge dual and joint BA programs and the post-baccalaureate pre-medical program. The joint program with List College of the Jewish Theological Seminary, of which I am a proud alumna, was created 67 years ago. Traditionally aged students complete a rigorous program of study at both List College and Columbia, earning two BAs in four years. This year, we have 39 students beginning in the joint program. And let's hear from you, new joint program students. In 2010, we launched our dual BA program with Sciences Po, the most distinguished university in France specializing in the social sciences. Two of the exceptional GS Sciences Po students were awarded Rhodes scholarships over the past several years. We have 135 students joining us after two years at Sciences Po. Let's hear from the Sciences Po students. In fall 2018, we welcomed the first dual BA program class in partnership with Trinity College Dublin. 
41 students are transitioning to Columbia this fall as part of that program, and we look forward to the first graduation of a full class from this program this coming May. Let's hear from the Trinity students. And we also have equally exciting and rigorous dual and joint programs with the City University of Hong Kong and Tel Aviv University. Today I'm happy to welcome 21 students as part of those programs. Last by no means least is the post-baccalaureate pre-medical pre-health program, the oldest and largest such program in the country. Today, we welcome 132 future physicians and other healthcare providers. These students in our post-bac pre-med pre-health program have already earned a bachelor's degree and they come to Columbia GS to pursue undergraduate courses in the hard sciences and social sciences in preparation for a career in medicine or another health field. You have a special place in my heart as my own scholarship focuses on public health and the social sciences. Concurrent with their academic preparation, post-bac pre-med students build experience by volunteering in some of the most rigorous clinical environments and they conduct serious scientific research with faculty on the Morningside and Health Sciences campuses. GS postbacs are nothing short of amazing, intellectually gifted and committed to changing for the better the world around us. Today, our new undergraduate and post-bac pre-med students join the most diverse student body in the Ivy League. Columbia GS was founded in 1947 in large part because of the first GI Bill. In recent years, we have made a concerted effort to return to our roots by making Columbia the destination for talented men and women completing military service. With almost 60 veterans beginning at GS today, we will have well over 400 student veterans at GS. This is in addition to the 65 incoming GS international students who have served in the armed forces in their own countries coming from Israel, South Korea, and Singapore, just to name a few. The undergraduate student veteran community at Columbia is three times the size of all of the other undergraduate student veteran communities in the Ivy League combined. GS is also the home to the largest percentage of international students and new Americans at an Ivy League college. Today, 200 international students start at Columbia GS, many of whom are beginning their studies from their home countries of Brazil, Turkey, and Austria, to name a few. We're so proud of our international students. Notably, we have almost 40 students starting at Columbia GS who are seeking to earn a second BA degree. And remaining true to our founding principle of providing access to an elite education for a wide array of students, GS is also home to more first generation students than any other college in the Ivy League. We are so proud that today, 35% of our undergraduate students are the first in their families to attend college. We are just that has to have a round of applause. Uh, finally, let me say a few words to you as not only your dean, but as an alumna of this great school. I know firsthand the transformative impacts of a Columbia education. You are about to embark on a journey that will challenge you academically, 
socially, and ultimately professionally. Embrace this opportunity and make the most of the challenges ahead. Get to know your classmates, the people sitting on your right and on your left. Get to know the amazing orientation leaders. Let me hear from the orientation leaders. <laughs> Who will guide you through this week. Get to know your faculty. Move out of your comfort zones. Take advantage of everything that the Columbia undergraduate program has to offer, including the ability to immerse yourself in the renowned core curriculum. Many of you attended Jumpstart last week and already know what I am talking about. Let me hear from the Jumpstart students. You all will have the chance to learn with and, and from some of the best students in the world, not only at GS, but at the other undergraduate colleges that are part of our community as well. Don't be afraid of new ideas and challenging philosophies that are the currency of a Columbia education. By challenging the notions you hold dear today, you begin to learn what you truly believe affirming and reaffirming those ideas that will sustain you professionally and most importantly, intellectually for the rest of your lives. I look forward to taking this journey with you, starting with this week's orientation. Congratulations to all of you, and on behalf of all of us here, I want to welcome you as our newest Colombians and GSers. I now have the distinct pleasure to introduce to you someone who will play a very important role in your experience as a student, the Dean of Students of the Columbia School of General Studies, Dr. Marlon Delva. <laughs> Dean Delva joined GS in the fall of 2019, so really just one full semester before the pandemic coming to us from the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, where she was a beloved and award-winning Dean of Students and Associate Dean of Student Affairs. Having worked previously with Dean Delva at Mailman and now for two years here at GS, I know that she brings energy, creativity, imagination, and dedication to our school and to you, its students. She has been a source of support and inspiration for our student community through unprecedented times, and we are so lucky to have her. Please welcome to the podium my dear colleague and friend, your Dean of Students, Marlon Delva. Thank you, Dean Rosenmatch, <clears throat> for such a kind introduction. The late Maya Angelou was quoted saying, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. I chose this quote today because you will hear a lot of words in the next few days. You will remember some of it, but most of it will probably be forgotten. And that is actually OK. The reason it is okay, because this week is about you taking in all that you have done to be here, all that you have experienced, overcome, and sacrificed. This week is about relishing in the moment that you're here to complete another chapter in your life, and how wonderful it is to be doing so in New York City and at Columbia University. Although you may forget some of what is said this week, we hope how you feel at the end of this week propels you into a semester and a time here like no other. A few months ago, when speaking with the vice dean, he shared a story with me about a student and the reason the student chose to come to GS. The student shared with the vice dean that he chose GS because he felt 
that we chose him because of who he was and not despite who he was, which he felt the other schools did. I share this example with you because you are joining us at an important and critical moment in history when there still remains much uncertainty. But we want you to feel certain that we chose you because we believe in you. We chose you because we are convinced of the success you will have. We chose you because we are clear you will enrich our academic discourse. We chose you because of who you are and because you belong here. Don't let a moment go by where you do not feel chosen because you belong and deserve to be here. And so if we do nothing else this week, we want to make sure that you know how much we value each and every one of you and we want you to feel that. Hence, as you're planning and exploring, writing papers, taking exams, applying to medical school, checking things off your, your personal to-do list, remember to give yourself time to digest, to sit with and recognize what it is you're doing. Remember that you worked hard to be here and you deserve to explore, engage, and enjoy every moment. Question what seems confusing, unclear, or that you want to explore further. Participate in what feels natural, but also allow yourself to go outside of your comfort zone. As it is in our discomfort, some of the greatest lessons in life are learned. And if ever in doubt, feeling lost, need more information, or simply a place to go to be heard, or to feel more connected, reach out to all of us who are eager to ensure your success. I'm truly excited to see what will come of all the things you'll accomplish here and what will mean for you and your family and friends and for our entire GS community. Our team looks forward to getting to know you this week and throughout the semester and to getting to know your stories. Know that I see you. We see you. And acknowledge this moment for the achievement that it is and the, for the power and potential it offers. And my promise to you today is that as our time together goes on, and we get deep into the day today, we won't let you forget to recognize this either. Congratulations. So I am excited to stay, get to stay up here a few more minutes to lead you in one of our favorite traditions at GS. While we're talking a lot today about the excitement the future holds, it's also striking to know where you, as a class, come from. So when I read a statement, if you are able to do so, please stand if the statement applies to you. You ready? Are you with me? Hello? All right, let me see who's in who's my class entering class of 2021. Please stand if you're able to, if you're the first in your family to go to college. If you are a parent, stand if you are a parent. If you are able, stand if you served in your country in the military. If you are able, you're transferring from a community college. If you're able, Stan, if you're a future doctor or healthcare professional because you're a student in our post-bac pre-med program.
if you are able, you're a student in one of our joint and dual degree programs. If you're able, you're planning to work full time while at GS. Fable, if you are able, please stand if you were born outside of the United States. If you are able, that you speak more than one language. If you are able, you're a lifelong New Yorker. If you're able, this is your first time in New York. And finally, if you're able, if you're excited to be at orientation at Columbia GS. Thank you so much for participating in that activity and also get to know one another. There's quite a diversity in this room. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to the stage the Dean for the post bac Pre-Med Program, Dr. James Culgrove. Thank you very much, Dean Delvo. What an auspicious moment to welcome the next generation of healthcare providers to the Columbia Post-Baccalaureate Pre-Medical Pre-Health Program. There is so much work to be done in the realm of healthcare, and there is such an urgent need for the skills and the knowledge that you will bring to your future careers as physicians, dentists, veterinarians, and allied health professionals. So welcome and congratulations on starting your journey. The Columbia Postback Pre-Med Program is the oldest, the largest, and in my completely unbiased opinion, the best program of its kind in the country. <laughs> you can applaud for that. In this program, you will receive a world-class science education and a range of supportive services that will make you highly competitive applicants to medical school. You are joining a vibrant community of more than 300 post -bac students at various stages of their professional journeys. You and your peers bring an exceptionally diverse array of backgrounds, academic and professional backgrounds, to the program. You've majored in classics, economics, psychology, English, and mathematics. You've done work in finance, tech, education, law, and human services. Your varied backgrounds do not place you at a disadvantage compared to students who followed a more traditional path to medicine. On the contrary, your backgrounds are a unique strength. We hear from admissions deans over and over how much they value our post back students. They value your maturity, your commitment, and your resilience, qualities you've demonstrated just by taking the step of being here today. You are very different from each other in the talents and perspectives you bring to your studies, but you all have in common a devotion to helping others. You are precisely the kind of healthcare providers the health professions want and need. The post -bac program will present you with extraordinary opportunities for intellectual, professional, and personal growth. Our location in New York City places you at the heart of a vast network of clinical and research sites where you can apply the knowledge that you've gained in the classroom in some of the most dynamic scientific and healthcare institutions in the world. The science courses you take in the post program will change the way you see the world. 
These courses will challenge you and exhilarate you. Sometimes they will frustrate you. Never hesitate to reach out to the many supportive services available to you through the GS Academic Resource Center and the university's science departments. The postback advising team is here to help you every step of the way. We are your guides and your cheerleaders. Your peers in the program are also sources of empathy, advice, and moral and practical support. Take advantage of that support. Don't just go to your classes and then lock yourself in your room and study. I mean, do go to your classes, do study, but don't do only that. Take a walk with a classmate. Make dinner with friends. Join a student group. You'll hear in a moment about some of the many opportunities that are available. Support each other. There is a large scientific literature demonstrating the beneficial effects of social connections on physical and mental health. So take the initiative and build your network, not just because it's professionally advantageous, although it certainly is, but because it's good for you. You're starting your pre-medical studies in the midst of a pandemic, and the stakes could not be higher. COVID is an epidemiological crisis, but it is also a social crisis that has been decades, even centuries, in the making. The inequities in rates of hospitalizations and deaths from COVID are the result of the injustice and racism that are deeply ingrained in our healthcare system and our society. The disproportionate burdens that COVID has had on African American and Latinx populations, First Nations people, and people who are incarcerated, those burdens are a moral outrage, and they are not unique to COVID. They extend to virtually any indicator of health status you could name. Those facts are not irrelevant to your future careers as health professionals. Let those facts be a call to action for you. Take inspiration from the knowledge that by starting this program, you are on your way to becoming part of the solution. As you study physics, chemistry, and biology, be mindful of the broader social context of your work and know that you can have an impact not just at the biological level, but at the societal level. As future healthcare providers, your work will provide you with unique opportunities to bring about the healthy and just society that we all want to see. COVID has taken a terrible toll and there are formidable challenges ahead, but as we welcome the next generation of healthcare providers, the incoming class of the Columbia Postback Pre-Med program, I am optimistic and I am filled with hope and pride. Columbia Postback students, congratulations and welcome. It is... It is now my honor to introduce to you the president of your highly active student association, the Postback Pre-Med Student Council. Please welcome Margaret Crownover. Thank you so much, Dean Colgrove. Good morning, GS, and welcome to Columbia. My name is Margaret Crownover, and I'm honored to be serving as the Postback Pre-Med Student Council president for the upcoming year. Exactly one year ago, I was sitting in the same position as you. If, of course, you disregard the fact that I was sipping coffee in my living room on Zoom instead of here on campus. But I, too, was about to embark on my first year as a post -bac student at GS. Beyond the exceptionally helpful guidance that I had received from my advisors to register for Gen Chem 1, Physics 1, and Calc 1, I still had a lot of questions. And might I add, I was not the only one who had questions. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the looks of surprise from the people in your life who you first shared the news with. Uh, hey mom, by the way, I'm gonna go to med school. Um, <laughs> for me, these responses ranged from confusion, wait, so you're an undergrad again? To doubt, 
Are you sure it's a good idea to give up a corporate law job? I've heard the path to med school is really long. Um, but to downright wrong but still supportive feedback such as, oh cool, yeah, like I know what a postdoc is. <laughs> and so there I was at postdoc pre-med orientation listening to my predecessor give an inspiring speech and welcoming us to GS while also fielding texts from my brothers trying to explain that a postdoc was not in fact the same as a postdoc. All the while though, I maintained a strong conviction that I had indeed finally found the right career path. This doesn't mean that I wasn't scared of the lengthy and spooky pre-med journey I had been warned about, but there I was doing it anyway. Because frankly, yes, I am an undergrad again. Yes, I am leaving my corporate law job to enroll in general chemistry one. Yes, I know that New York City is an expensive place to live. And yes, I will indeed be spending my Saturdays trying to calculate the distance traveled by a wooden block when a spring force is applied. But what else would I be doing? I have learned that the pa in the past year that my choice to pursue a profession in the healthcare field is not a dissertation that requires defense, but instead is a choice that just feels right. You don't need to have every step of the journey mapped out or have predicted your medical specialty or need to present an itemized list of how exactly you reach this decision and your hypothesized results. I mean, you're already here, aren't you? We all arrived upon this unconventional choice by way of a unique path, and yet we share a common goal that is fundamentally centered on the wellness of our fellow human beings. People forget that, an, that a career in healthcare is just as much an art as it is a science. The truth is that an excellent healthcare professional isn't just the one who can read your ultrasound or analyze an MRI. It's the one who knows empathy, pain, and fear. It's the one who knows humility. While unconventional or midlife crisis may be the words used to describe the, jour the journey you are about to embark on, so what? Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Something in each of you sparked the decision that led you here to pursue healthcare. Trust yourself, you're doing great. Thank you, congratulations again, and welcome to Columbia. Thank you, Margaret. I'm very happy to now ask our List College Student Council President, Ariel Katz, for a few short words. Thank you, Dean Delva. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Columbia University. My name is Ariel Katz, and I'm studying Hebrew Bible at JTS and psychology at Columbia. I serve as president of the List College Student Council. List College is the undergraduate school of the Jewish Theological Seminary, otherwise known as JTS, and is located just up Broadway from Columbia on 122nd Street. There are approximately 150 students enrolled at List College. To answer the question on some people's mind, no, not everyone in our program wants to become a rabbi. Only some do. About 10% of each List College class goes on to rabbinical ordination, but I thought I'd clear up this popular misconception and explain that 90% of us, including myself, do not end up as rabbis. Students at LIST participate in either our joint program with Columbia School of General Studies, the program I'm in, or the double degree program with Barnard College. In these programs, students earn two bachelor's degrees, one from Columbia or Barnard in any academic discipline of their choosing, and one from JTS in a specialized field of Jewish study. The program aims to educate both sides of the American Jewish student, to make them both a well-rounded intellectual and a well-rounded Jew through the comprehensive core curricula of both schools. This partnership between Columbia and JTS has existed since 1954. I am proud to share that the JTS Columbia Joint Program became the model for other programs of this nature. Thus, General Studies offers additional dual degree programs with Sciences Po in France, the Sydney University of Hong Kong, Trinity College in Dublin, and most recently, Tel Aviv University. 
To all of the dual degree students, I want to congratulate you on starting your journey at GS. I hope that you love it as much as I have. We may not appear to be your typical GS student, primarily because of our traditional college age. However, we do fit in because of our non-traditional approach to education through gaining these two undergraduate degrees. I want to emphasize to you our pride and appreciation for being members of the GS community. Every GS student has something remarkable to add to our collective academic experience, and it is an honor for us young adults to stand side by side with veterans, professionals, and parents as we go through college with the desire to learn, improve ourselves, and advance our communities. GS is a unique and unparalleled academic experience due in large part to our incredibly diverse community that we just learned so much about. My greatest hope is that each of you fall in love with this school and this college experience. Join clubs, sports teams, religious groups, and performing arts groups. Attend lectures about topics that you are barely informed on. And don't shy away from all of the opportunities that this phenomenal university has to offer. I hope you take advantage of our community and take the time to learn from one another. I wish you the best of luck with the beginning of your studies here at Columbia, and I can't wait to see you on College Walk. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Now I'd like to welcome Serengeti Tumangwa, General Studies Student Council President. Hi, everyone. I'm Serengeti Timungwa. I'm the president of the Columbia General Studies Student Council. And on behalf of the council, I'm honored uh, to welcome you all here today uh, on our beautiful Morningside campus. The last time our fall orientation welcoming event took place in 2019, um, I was sitting right where you are. Um, and it was so special to me. Um, and that's really why I'm so relieved that you have the chance to experience this too. The past year and a half has proven challenging for every single one of us um, in this room or under this tent, um, and yet through it all, you have made your way into one of the most prestigious and rigorous institutions in the world. As I've said perhaps too many times, this is the essence of a GS student, resilience. Whether you're coming here after completing a long professional career, after having spent two years in another country through one of our international dual degree programs, after having served in the armed forces, after having a family, or after, having taken, after taking a break in your education, um, through it all, you've shown resilience and courage, and that is why you're here today. <clears throat> you may have lost loved ones or perhaps gotten sick yourself this past year, you may have faced additional financial challenges as a result of the pandemic or had to suddenly become a caregiver. Like many, you may have also faced a certain level of isolation this past year or felt as though you're missing out, and yet you're here today. I cannot say this warmly enough, but welcome to your new home. You're now part of a community that will fully understand the challenges you've overcome the sacrifices you've had to make, and the type of resilience it takes to get here. You have earned your spot and you belong here. As mentioned before, GS has been my home since fall 2019. After having been in and out of high school due to homelessness and making it to college, I was forced to drop out of my previous college due to family. Mentally, I felt I'd hit a rock bottom since my education had always been important to me as a first generation college student. More importantly, I felt like I had failed my younger sibling. I wanted to set an example for her and felt as though I couldn't do that any longer. Still, I decided I would make the most out of my time and move to DC. There, I interned on the Hill, working on legislation for maternal health and doing research on unaccompanied migrant youth. I then moved back to New York and worked at a legal nonprofit where I was able to help further reproductive rights for women in the highest courts of the United States. Through it all, even though I had considerable political experience, such as registering more than 10,000 New Yorkers to vote or staffing a youth civic engagement bill all the way to the governor of California's desk, I kept hitting a wall, many walls. Um, in the final stages of interviews, I kept being told that I was a great candidate, but sadly, 
my application could not proceed because I didn't have a degree. I was even told this by a prominent US senator. I won't spill the beans on who, but I definitely went home and cried that day. <laughs> I felt so limited. Um, I felt very trapped, and that is where GS comes in. GS was another chance for me to prove my capabilities. GS has been a ticket that has gotten me through more doors than I could have ever imagined. That is exactly why I'm so thrilled you all made the decision to either start or continue your education here. It was the right decision. I urge you to get to know your peers. At GS, prepare to have your perspectives shifted and your boundaries broadened by your classmates. Here, you'll find fellow students with compelling GS stories. I'm sure you've had to develop your own GS story. As rusty as you may feel when it comes to social interaction, I promise you won't regret it one bit. I'm sure you've received tons of advice leading up to today and will receive much more in the weeks to come. I apologize in advance if you've heard this one before, but while you're at GS, remember to focus on your path. At Columbia, there may be a lot of noise around you at times. Sometimes you may feel as though you're not doing enough. You might compare yourself to others and feel inadequate. While it will always be important to learn from others and surround yourself from people who challenge you, in those moments, remember why you came here and remember your path. This will help you, this will help you get to where you need to be. Finally, I want to emphasize that GSSC is here to represent you all. In the past year, we worked with the GS and university administrations to elevate and address student concerns, leading to a freeze in tuition for the 2020-2021 academic year, emergency financial supports for, stu for, support for students um, you know, navigating COVID, and more comprehensive grading policies, among other solutions. GSSC also continuously works to be more inclusive and representative, amending our constitution to reflect gender inclusive language and including a referenda clause for students to vote directly on issues that are important to them. If you ever have any questions, suggestions, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us. You will be receiving communications from us shortly and where our, where our contact information will be listed. We will also be opening up some roles in the next couple of weeks and could use fresh perspectives. Once again, on behalf of the GSSC, I'm thrilled to welcome you to GS and for some of you to New York. And remember that the council is always here if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you, Serengeti. It is now my pleasure to welcome Kirsty Jardine, GS15, co-chair of the GS Alumni Association. Thank you, Dean Delva. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I apologize in advance. I'm going to try really hard not to get emotional, but as I've been telling everyone this morning, it's a really great day, and I might break as I go through my welcome to you all. So I apologize for nothing. It's very exciting to be here. Um, so I want to thank uh, Dean Rosenmetsch and President Bollinger and the entire GS staff for inviting me here today. Um, and I want to say a hearty congratulations to the new GS students and the countless friends and loved ones who've helped you all on your journey to get here today. As you heard, my name is Kirsty Jardine, a GS graduate from the class of 2015, and I co-chair the GS Alumni Association with my counterpart, Damien Harfouche. As a New Yorker, which they say I'm officially allowed to call myself now that I've been here longer than 10 years, so my New Yorkers in the audience, you can come fight me on that later. Um, and as a public health professional myself, I'm especially honored and I'm very deeply moved to be part of this event today because I really know what it took to make this happen safely for all of us. My own orientation was actually in the spring semester, and it was during a massive blizzard. And the following semester, we had to deal with replanning orientation due to Superstorm Standy. So the Columbia team is really no stranger to adapting to incredible challenges, but it really is an amazing testament to how incredibly hard working and dedicated they are that we're all able to come together in person today to celebrate the beginning of your GS journey. And I believe I had to get all kinds of secret service level um, clearance to be here myself, so I'm particularly grateful to you all. Um, <clears throat> 
As co-chair of the GSAA, um, I volunteer alongside my peers to help collect alumni to our students, to one another, and back to the university. I like to give back to Columbia because of how much GS truly gave me. When I reflect on my time, I can vividly remember sitting where you are many, many years ago, maybe not that many, um, wondering how the hell I got here, uh, super nervous, but really excited for what was to come. Um, and I can promise you I still feel that way every single time I'm back on campus and every single time I do these speeches. Um, and it's because you're truly surrounded by some really remarkable people. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, and I feel like this is a theme of today, it's the value of our communities. Today you're joining a very, very special one. Even though it's only day one and classes haven't started yet, although I know some of you got a jump start last week, you're already considered a member of the alumni family. Um, I really hope that you'll take advantage of the experience while you're here and truly learn how to leverage those prior experiences and continue to enhance your GS story. I never really fully appreciated the value of learning how transferable skills can shape your trajectory until I learned from my fellow students and alumni and started to see how my own journey has evolved. I currently work as a senior special advisor to the chief information officer at the New York City Housing Authority. And one of the first questions I get from people is, oh, so you must have a background in IT. And I love being able to tell people, nope, I know absolutely nothing about IT. I was a classical studies major at GS, so I spent all my time looking for the verb at the end of Cicero's sentences. Um, and I then went on to complete my master's in public health, um, again a theme of today, um, as part of the GS Mailman Accelerated Degree Track. Um, from there I went on to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and I worked in their Office of Emergency Preparedness and Response, where I prepared for anthrax and coastal storm events. So in short, as I say, no, I know nothing about IT or cybersecurity, but I do have an understanding and have a lot of experience in systems thinking, relationship building, and logistics planning for large-scale operations. So when we need to figure out how to come up with a tech solution to authenticate vaccination and testing status for over 10,000 employees, I'm not just thinking about the technology, but I'm thinking about how we're gonna operationalize that for 325 development staff throughout all the five boroughs, 3,000 of whom do not have work emails or work cell phones. I also understand why the lead department is panicking about elevated blood lead levels in children under six, and how more stringent XRF testing um, has an enormous impact on the quality of our data and the implications to our obligations as an authority. I can think through and plan out what a program to provide broadband technology solutions to our low-income residents should look like. And I share all of this not to brag, although shameless self-promotion is never necessarily a bad thing, but because I've listened to so many students and alumni over the years talk about their time and their work experience, and it's always so inspiring to me, and at times it's really a little bit intimidating. So if you feel that way, don't worry, that's normal. Uh, but I've always been encouraged to reach out and to connect with my fellow members of the community. And every single time I've done that, I've been met with support, advice, and endless encouragement. I would never have had the confidence personally to follow the path I'm on and understand the value of my prior experiences and what that brings to an organization without this continued support and encouragement. I can't tell you how many times I found not second or third degree, but first degree GS connections on LinkedIn for positions I've been interested in. Never necessarily individuals I've been particularly close to or acquainted with, but enough that I've been able to reach out for information or questions, and every single time they've been receptive and willing to help and chat about positions, have put resumes forward for me, and have given me interview insights and tips so that I've been prepared and informed for interviews I might be preparing for. And they've given me really great feedback when I've needed it. So countless opportunities have come my way, and I'm in this new IT realm that I know nothing about, but I'm faking it till I make it. Um, and this all holds true for a number of GS um, alumni and students that, that I know out in the world. So in closing, I want to ask you to remember how special your fellow GSs are, and that the GS alumni are a resource. We're here for you, and we really want to support you. Throughout the year, you'll have opportunities to meet the alumni relations and development team, who are all sitting right here in the front, um, and they will invite you to events to connect you to fellow Colombians from around the world. Please take advantage of this fantastic opportunity whenever you can. On behalf of my fellow alumni, once again, welcome, congratulations, and we're so happy to have you as part of our community. Thank you so much, Kirstie. 
Finally, I would like to introduce Dr. Victoria Rosner, Dean of Academic Affairs. Thank you, Dean Delva. Good morning, New Columbians. I I really have to join Kirsty in expressing my sense of the incredible joy of this moment that after 18 months apart from each other, we are together. And we are starting, orientation is always a moment of beginnings, but this beginning exceeds any I have known in my career as an educator. I wanna, in delivering the final remarks of the morning, talk about the joy of the moment, and then also about the responsibilities that attend upon it. I wanna talk just for a moment about the academic culture that you are joining as New Columbians and the very important role that GS students play in the culture of this institution. The Columbia undergraduate experience is truly like none other in the universe of higher education in no small part because of Columbia's famous core curriculum. You have heard a little bit about it today and you will hear much more. The Columbia core was first created 100 years ago at a time when the world in many ways seemed to be coming apart. At that moment in 1919, the US was still dealing with the political unrest activated by the First World War. It was stunned by outbreaks of violence against African Americans and immigrants and beset by a deadly flu pandemic that tore across the world and killed millions of people. I know that all this sounds frighteningly familiar. Facing these challenges, the Columbia faculty of 1919 conceived a bold educational experiment in undergraduate education to bring together small groups of students for critical reflection on their own lives and the world that they were inheriting. The core was built on the belief that continues to this day that seminars of Columbia undergraduates could tackle the problems of the present by looking through the lenses of the past and debating with authors from across the centuries. Today, the core continues to evolve in response to our own historical moment, adding new texts to address questions of racial diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I'm very proud to say that this year, for instance, Literature Humanities, one of the founding courses of the core curriculum, will include not only the traditional Homer and Plato, but also Susan Laurie Parks, Aimé Césaire, and Claudia Rankin. The Columbia core and the Columbia faculty more broadly take GS students very seriously. Like no other university in the Ivy League, at Columbia, non-traditional students and students with a non-traditional approach to education are welcomed for all that they contribute to the culture of the university. Your experiences in other countries, in the workplace, in the armed services, in your families are mighty assets in the classroom here. You are joining Columbia at a historic moment. After over a year of remote learning necessitated by the pandemic, we are delighted beyond measure to be re-entering the classroom. If you were at Professor Hamid Debashi's Jumpstart lecture last Wednesday, as I was, you heard him describe the Columbia classroom as a sanctified space, like a synagogue for a rabbi or a mosque for an imam, he said. It is a place where you will find the horizons of your imagination being expanded in ways you never imagined possible. I guarantee it. It is a place where you will find yourself reborn through profound insights and newly discovered passions. The Columbia classroom can equip you to contend with the problems of the present moment and help you to inhabit the signal dramas of the past. 
We are all, I know, returning to the classroom with a renewed sense of conviction around the value of a liberal arts education and the role it plays in forging responsible citizens of our global society. Last week, I also spoke with a faculty member in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences who told me very strongly how important it was that students be on campus to study the impact of climate change. I have heard the same urgency from political scientists, from astronomers, and from classicists. They all feel it, and you will too. You are making a really significant commitment by choosing to launch your Columbia education and to join our community at this particular time, a moment when the pursuit of knowledge and the use of that knowledge to better the world has never seemed more important. Equally vital and essential to our pursuit of knowledge is our shared belief in learning with integrity. And now I will come back to the part of my remarks that address your responsibility as students here. Today, you join a culture that values the exchange of ideas, the rigorous examination of evidence and thought, and open, honest participation in learning and scholarly work. Academic integrity is the cornerstone of our world. All the ideas you will study here are the product of intellectual labor and exchange, and all Columbia faculty and students hold in common an ethical commitment to credit the ideas of others when we draw upon them, to submit only our own work, and to uphold academic integrity in all that we do. These ideas are embodied in the Columbia Honor Pledge, which you will become familiar with, and which was written by undergraduate students at Columbia for Columbia. I'm going to read the statement to you. We, the undergraduate students of Columbia University, hereby pledge to value the integrity of our ideas and the ideas of others by honestly presenting our work, respecting authorship, and striving not simply for answers, but for understanding in pursuit of common scholastic goals. In this way, we seek to build an academic community governed by our collective efforts, diligence, and code of honor. Joining the Columbia academic community, as you all are doing today, means taking this pledge and committing to its values and goals. It means conducting yourself with integrity and supporting your peers in doing the same. You are bound to your fellow students by this shared commitment and these values of integrity, equity, and honor. We all depend on each other in this effort, and our strength derives from our ability to trust and rely on one another. I have never been more proud to be part of Columbia GS than I am today, and to be with you on this important day of beginnings. As you embark next week, on your coursework in the Columbia Core Curriculum and beyond, I'd like to leave you with the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, who argued in 1903 that education must not simply teach work, it must teach life. This year, as we enter the newly reopened Columbia campus, we will all be teaching and learning life, supporting and sustaining one another through the challenges that are ahead and I am so glad to be on this journey with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roster. As we prepare to recess, I would like to take a moment to introduce you to some people you've likely already met, the people who come to work every day believing in the mission of GS and believing in you, the staff of the School of General Studies. I'm going to ask each team to stand, and we could all applaud for them, and ask them to save standings so that we can recess out. The first team, admissions. <laughs> Operations and information systems. Operations and information systems.
Communications. Our Educational Financing Team. Alumni Relations. The post back pre-med team. The Office of the Dean of Students. Academic Affairs. Vice Dean and Dean of the School. And last but not least, our orientation leaders. <laughs> Students, our dais and our staff and orientation leaders are going to recess out. We ask you to stay seated um, so that you could hear a couple of instructions from your new student orientation chair, Michael Landis. Congratulations and best of luck.